to arms, to arms, was the shout that echoed throughout our sweet Southland. And answering the call poured forth our men, even boys, eager for the fray. At first we thought nothing serious of it. It was merely a frolic, a playing at war. But darker and darker drew and grew the storm clouds. For Sherman was marching into Georgia. Then it was run and flee, hurry, scurry, run here, run there, gather up your valuables, bury your treasures, things like syrup, not necessarily gold and silver, scraps of denim cloth, factory cloth saved to be made up for the soldiers, a piece of bacon, home-knit socks. It would have been laughable if it weren't so pathetic. For Sherman was coming, and we lay in his wake. Like a giant octopus, his arms stretched out, gathering everything, leaving behind only ruin and desolation. And altogether, not 20 men left around to protect us. I've often wondered that if the men who fought in this civil war suffered as much as we women did, left behind to tend to things, fight life's battles silently, and we did it all for the sanctity of home. Miss A.C. Cooper, war refugee from Atlanta, Georgia. Her point of view. Now we need to look at the other point of view from General William Tecumseh Sherman, why he did the march, what was his intent. Some people who live in Rome, Georgia, claimed that that is where he made the plans for the march, from Atlanta ultimately to Savannah. Some people say in Kingston, Georgia, that's where he received the official permission from General Grant to conduct the march. Before he started the march, when, so to speak, he went incommunicado, cutting off all communications for about a month, he wrote a letter to his wife, Ellen. And I would like to recite that letter. My dearest Ellen, I have my wedge in pretty deep and must be careful I don't get my fingers pinched. I can make this march. I can make the people of Georgia howl. Where one million people find subsistence, my soldiers won't starve. And if the people of Georgia howl, say to them, war is war. It is not popularity seeking. If the people of Georgia want peace, they and their relatives must simply stop war. The people of Georgia will not love us, but they can grow to fear us and dread the passage of our troops through their countryside. It is a paradox, but the best way to end this civil war is to bring the South to its knees. It's a big game but I can do it, and I am too red-headed to be patient. Your loving husband, William Tecumseh Sherman. When the march was decided and all preparations were being made for the evacuation of Atlanta and the burning of quite a big portion of it before the soldiers left, Sherman read his men Special Field Order Number 20. This is an abbreviated version, but this was what all the soldiers were given and heard and what their commanding officers were instructed to enforce. The march. The army will forage liberally on the country during the march. To this end, each brigade commander will organize a good and sufficient foraging party under the command of one or more discreet officers who will gather 
near the route traveled, whatever is needed by the command, aiming at all times to keep in the wagons at least ten days' provisions, three days' forage. Soldiers must not enter the dwellings of the inhabitants or commit any trespass, but during a halter camp they may be permitted to gather turnips, potatoes, other vegetables, and to drive in stock inside of their camp. To regular foraging parties must be entrusted the gathering of provisions and forage at any distance from the road travel. Now, of course, we know today that many of the soldiers didn't pay too much attention to this, and Sherman looked the other way. Some commanders were much more serious about enforcing the order to the T, and others looked the other way, too. Women learned by experience that the worst thing for them to do, even though it was the most frightening, the worst thing for them to do was to evacuate their home, to leave it and go someplace else. For those homes that weren't inhabited, quite often the Union soldiers thought, they're cowards here, and they burned the house down. But if you had the guts to stay there, you were instructed to hide as many of your belongings and valuables as you could, lock them up, close your front door, and then stand on your front porch to meet the Yankees face to face. And this was hard for Southern women not to give a lot of sass, but if you controlled your sass, then chances are your house would not be burned down. But the outline buildings would be your smoke houses, your barns, your chicken houses, and of course, where you had the cotton gin and all those sort of things that would provide for the Southern way of life and the Southern army. I have four stories from this book that I wrote that I would like to present to you now as personal experiences, true stories of women who experienced these 60,000 Yankees marching through Georgia and having the time of their lives. What do these women do? And while I was writing this book, I often thought, what would I do under these circumstances? Would I have the gumption to stand up and face these Yankees? Uh, and I think we can draw some inspiration from these four stories. I'm going to start off with, of course, your local heroine, Mary Harris Gay, Mary Ann Harris Gay, who was a Georgia woman of achievement later on, and see if I can bring some of her stories to life. In all walks of life, it has become apparent that energy, pluck, and a firm devotion to providence can help you overcome all difficulties. And of these three things, I have a goodly amount. We were saddened by the news that the Yankees had crossed the Chattahoochee River and were coming to Decatur. General William Tecumseh Sherman the Nero of the 19th century. And that's the highest compliment I paid him. He was the leader of this ruthless, godless band of men who marched in their own form of patriotism, ready to take over our fair city of Decatur. Now, my mother and I were determined not to leave, to stay at our home, why should we be forced to leave our home? We would take in washing, darning, ironing of the Union soldiers in order to have a reason to stay and charge them what we called reasonable rates. All done under the labors of love idea. But first I had to prepare for the Yankees because my brother David, who served in the Confederate Army, had entrusted me with some of his winter clothing as well as some of his fellow soldiers. Now, if the Federal soldiers found this Confederate uniforms in my house, they would think me a traitor. 
they would burn the house down. So I could not take that chance. I had to find an appropriate way to hide them. So first, I moved a table over to the corner of the wall and put a chair on the table and then stepped up onto the table and onto the chair so I could reach the ceiling. I took a hammer and a chisel and started to tap in a small hole in the ceiling. When it was big enough, I put in my fingers so I could reach out and grab bigger chunks of plaster. When the hole was big enough, I could put the, the top of the clothing box across the last to, to make sort of a shelf. And then I could place the clothing on the shelf. I could not patch back up the hole, so I got down off the table, moved it out of the way, and with all my strength, remember I have a goodly share of pluck and energy, I pushed the dresser that was ceiling high, so it covered up the hole. But then what to do with the chunks of plaster and the dust? That would rouse suspicion. So I took hammer or whatever I could find to, to crunch up the plaster into smaller chunks. And then I took the chunks and I, I put them into in, any empty or partially empty vessel in the house. And when it was dark and the coast was clear, I took these vessels and I emptied them into our pile of ashes out in the backyard. That was solved. But now what to do with the dust? That was a more tedious problem. I took flannel rags and wet them and tried to wipe up as much of the dust as I could. No one suspected a thing. And then later on, when the soldiers needed this clothing, I just reversed the process, waited till night when no one was looking or paying attention, and just reversed it all and got the, the clothing down. And to send it to my brother, I had empty crocus sacks which I managed to round up from federal camps. I was never one to waste anything. There was always a use for everything, especially in these times. So I stuffed the crocus sacks. Well, the crocus sacks were used for grain. No one knew now that they had Confederate clothing in them. I stuffed them with the Confederate clothing. I sewed it up with twine and then got permission to go visit my sister in Augusta but on the way, I remembered I had forgotten the most valuable piece of clothing. It was a scarf my sister-in-law had knit for David, her husband. A hand-knit scarf. How could I forget that? My brother David did not survive the war. I know if he had the scarf, it would not have changed his fate, but it would have comforted us to know that he knew how much he was dearly loved. The federal soldiers camped out in our backyard for three months. Sometimes they used our house for their headquarters. This gave me many opportunities to hoodwink the Yankee soldiers. I found newspapers they had left, and I took them and stuffed them up underneath my dress. It gave me a rather fashionable bustle. I took the New York Daily Ledger, the Cincinnati Inquirer, the Philadelphia Evening Ledger, and made myself a bustle. I had permission to leave town, and I took these newspapers to the Confederate. His name was, I believe he was a captain, Captain Rank. He was very grateful for the news that I gave him. Then when the federal soldiers pulled out, things were very difficult for us. People were starving. There were so many homeless refugees just wandering the streets. I got industrious, and I went to the vacated camps by General Gerard. 
I found a half a bushel of corn kernels the federal soldiers had left behind. I could parch them in the sun, grind them into cornmeal, share my proceeds with those less fortunate. I could grind up okra seeds and make a fairly decent coffee out of it. And then in December, after the federal soldiers had made it to Savannah, we got word from the Confederate commissary that they were exchanging food for lead. I went down to where General Hood's ordnance train had exploded last September. And in the cold, with my fingers and a knife, I scraped up what I could find of bullets and mini balls. My fingers were bleeding and frozen, but this is how we survived. It was called working the lead mine. That was the war. But I think all that we were doing at this time, it was just perilous people doing the best that they could to support their principles. You see, my pluck, it came in handy in those days. Mary Ann Harris Gay, Decatur's own. My name is Allie Travis. I'm from Covington, Georgia. November 17th, 1864, the Yankees started marching past our front porch. It was beautiful that November the azaleas and the camellias were out, even those hardened Yankees. They couldn't fail to notice our beauty. As they marched past our house, some would break ranks and go to the chicken coops to try to steal the chickens. But the chickens got rather wise to it and started flying around. Then the Yankees had to grab sticks and clubs to chase the chickens, and it was rather humorous. In the midst of a rather serious occasion, now Mother anticipated Yankee rapacity, and she gathered our two turkeys and she hid them in the closet. <laughs> they escaped that Yankee rapacity. They did. Now, Mother told my sister and me to go sit on the front porch and to knit socks. She was hoping that this would quiet me because I was rather known for my southern fervor. As the Yankees passed, though, I had a strange glint in my eye, for as I was knitting our yarn balls in the very center, they had our family's gold watches, hidden from greedy Yankee eyes. There was this Yankee officer who came on the front porch and he had the nerve to lecture me about the sins of secession. My heart was stirred. My blood was iron. I stood up and started to lecture to him. My sister was tugging at my sleeves to make me sit down to quiet me, but my tongue was loosed. However, I realized, and so did he, that neither one of us was going to change. For if you change a man's opinion against his will, he's of the same opinion still. <laughs> he left, and later on that day, a band paraded by, and they were playing Dixie. I said, you must be at a shortage for tunes, for you're playing one of ours. Then they stopped and played Yankee Doodle. That was too much for me. I grabbed my sister. We went back inside and closed the door. I said, I will have none of that tune. Later on, we found out we made the Yankee papers. They said the women of Covington were quite fetching to the eyes but quite strong in Southern spirit. 
when the bands played by playing Yankee Doodle. The southern women went in their houses, closed the shutters, locked the doors, would have none of that. Now, that kind of notoriety, I don't mind at all. My name is Cornelia Screv, and I'm a widow with seven children. My youngest son is at home, thank goodness, but my oldest son, only 16, went to Savannah. And we all know the, the federal soldiers are headed that way. Every day I pray for his safety. He's only 16. What does he know of fighting? My niece, Miss Maxwell, came to live with us. She was a refugee from the Athens area. One day we saw one of our boys riding past our house. He was a Lieutenant Conyers. We shouted after him, where are you going, sir? We're far outnumbered. We're all leaving. But what are we to do, sir, without you here? He said, well, hide your valuables. Stand on your front porch. Wait for the Yankees. And pray to God that you make it through. I did what he said. I hid all our valuables and hid the key in my pocket. And then my niece and I went on the front porch and waited for the Yankees to come. I forgot to mention one thing that we did. My family's silver. I made a, a slit in our here sofa and, and I put the silver in there. It was some 54 pieces of silver, mostly spoons and forks. Then the Yankees came. But the first ones to come were quite gentlemanly. An adjutant Mitchell, his friend, Lieutenant Samples, and, well, they were very ragged and filthy, but very apologetic. They, they were so sorry for the way they looked. And they asked us, after they got cleaned up, if they could come back and offer us some protection. We said we would like that. And after they left, some other Yankees came who weren't such gentlemen. The leader of the pack rushed into the house, burst open my dressers, my drawers, my closets, tore things, put them on the floor, stamped on them, tore them up, and then he happened to notice a mirror. And he was rather impressed by the way he looked. His red hair stood up like quills on a porcupine. He had a tall black hat, obviously stolen. He had a, a coat made out of three different kinds of carpet. His knees were coming out of his breeches. His toes were coming out of his shoes. But all in all, he thought he made a most wondrous presence. He was in some sort of trance when his fellow gang member shouted for him to come. They were leaving to go to some other house to perform their degradations. We were glad to be rid of them. And then later on, Adjutant Mitchell and Lieutenant Samples came. Obviously, benefits of a bath. We invited them to come in, and they sat on our sofa. Now, Adjutant Mitchell was a slender fellow, but Lieutenant Samples was rather heavy set. And when he sat down, the forks and spoons began to jingle. My niece immediately said, Oh, I'll pull up these chairs for you. You'll probably be more comfortable. We're missing a roller off the sofa. Well, the gentleman stood up and the sofa jingle jangled some more. 
But they looked at each other and smiled. I think they had experienced many jingling sofas during the march. And they said not a word. Then Adjutant Mitchell produced a Bible that he had kept in his knapsack. It was from a southern soldier that had been found. A, a, a Campbell was the soldier's name, John Campbell. And he asked if I would see that John Campbell got the Bible back. I said I would see what I could do. And Adjutant Mitchell said, we hope this war is over soon and that we can all go back to being brothers again. That is what I hope for more than anything. Then the two of them said they had to leave. They were pulling out the next morning. That is the last we would see of them. And I heard later on that Adjutant Mitchell, he was killed outside Fayetteville, North Carolina, the small battle of Monroe Crossroads, just a few days before General Johnston surrendered to General Sherman. His commander, Colonel George Spencer, praised him most highly. And then the hog thieves came. They took all of our hogs, and I was saying, I have children to feed. Can't you spare us one hog? And they said, certainly not. Get out of our way. They left, but not before someone came and forced them out. We had another savior. He was a young soldier named Hodges, and he produced a pistol, and he chased the hog thieves away, for in those days you were never sure, was it a Yankee soldier who was here giving you trouble? Was it some Confederate renegade? Was it some runaway? We always blamed it on the Yankees, though. Well, this little soldier named Hodges... He saw my niece and I. We sat down on our jingling sofa and began to cry. It had been such a harrowing day. And he said, ladies, don't cry. I, I've never seen a woman cry that hasn't made me want to cry too. <laughs> we made a rather ludicrous sight. Two southern women and a federal soldier boo-hooing together on the jingling sofa. <laughs> the next day, our hog thief returned, quite drunk with his band and wanting to use our piano for a revelry. But we were rescued again by another soldier named Coffee from Kentucky. He chased them away and this time gave my niece a pistol. She hid it in the piano for safekeeping. And then we noticed that this hawk thief had left his wallet sort of like a little purse behind on our jingling sofa. And my niece picked it up and revealed the contents. Thirty-five greenback dollars, quite valuable to us. 65 in worthless Confederate script, a set of gold pens, some postage stamps, and a do bill. It had his name on it, James Pope. My children wrote afterwards, James Pope, comma, hog thief. <laughs> then we found a love letter. We opened it up and read it, and it said, my dearest Jim, I have been a-crying ever since you left for the war. We hope those rebel engines won't hurt you none. What was that you drunk about me last night? Your loving Sally. When all was said and done, we figured the contents of that wallet, probably even the love letter by itself, <laughs> was worth all the aggravation we had suffered those days. And I am happy to report my 16-year-old son, he came home safe after the war. Now that was a happy day.
My name is Kate Means. We lived in South Carolina. My husband, our three children. And then the war started. And of course, my husband went to fight. We were all involved in the cause. At first, he left me behind to take care of things. It was hard. But every night before I went to sleep, after I'd put the children down, I would write him a letter and I would talk to him just as if he were right there beside me, asking his advice. What should I do? How should I do this? And in talking to him through the letter, I knew what to do. I'd often send homemade goods. And he wrote back and said, Kate, it has been decided that you are the best wife in our regiment. He came home for a few days on leave before he was to go to some place called Gettysburg. It was the first time the Southern Army was so deep in Union soil. We had a wonderful reunion, but when he left, I had this sinking feeling that that would be the end of it. We didn't hear from him. And then we got word that he was missing in action. But that gave me hope. As long as they didn't produce a body, there was still hope. He could still be alive. And as long as I kept thinking those thoughts, he had to be alive. We searched everywhere for him. And then in December, 1864, I got a letter. It was obviously written from a very weak hand. But I recognized that handwriting. It was my husband's. He was alive. Just as I thought, he said he had been captured and had been in a Yankee prison hospital and then was sent down south to Savannah. He wanted me to come. He wanted to see me one last time. So I, I took the children over to my father-in-law's and I made my way through the Confederate lines in South Carolina. They were very helpful. I was going home to my husband to bring him back to his real home. When I got to Savannah, it was chaotic there. Sherman and his soldiers had just arrived and people were going crazy what to do, where to go, how to handle this. but. I did find out where the southern soldiers, where their hospital was, the prisoners of war, and I worked my way there. There was no one around who could help me find my husband. I'd have to find him myself. I tried not to look at the pitiful sights. Just focus on finding my husband. Then I heard this weak voice shout out my name. Kate. It was my husband. So close to death. But I vowed I was not going to let him die this undignified death in this filthy hospital. There was a preacher who helped me remove my husband. We got to stay in the parsonage. He got us food and water. It was my goal to get my husband strong enough to go back home, for he wanted to see our children one last time. That's what kept him going. I went down to the docks and I spoke to the Union soldier who was in charge and 
told him that I had a husband close to death and I was hoping to cross the Savannah River to get back to South Carolina before he died. And he said, let me help you. It did not matter that his color of his uniform was blue. He had a good heart. And not only did he provide an ambulance, but a guard. He accompanied us to the boat. We made our way across the Savannah River into South Carolina, made it back home. My husband saw the children. Two days later, he died. I am one of those many war widows. We are left. We must be the strong survivors. Kate Means. Those are just a few of the stories that I came across in writing this book, General Sherman and the Georgia Bells, Tales from Women Left Behind. Some people hear this story and they think, ah, oh, General Sherman, like a sailor, had a woman in a report. But no, that's not true at all. They're not love stories in here except women's love for their family, the sanctity of their home, and for their husbands. Uh, there are many different sections in the book, and interspersed, I have letters that Sherman wrote to his wife. And I wanted to put in the middle my biography of Sherman, but the publisher said, no, this is the women's story, and they put it at the end, like an appendix. But I found it very interesting to read about his life and to try to humanize this man that so many people in Georgia call the devil incarnate, <laughs> the devil himself. Uh, so do you have any questions that you would like to ask me? That's the end of the formal presentation. And I'd love to hear questions, thoughts, comments from some of you. This is not that what you spoke about, but it was very interesting. Unlike other meetings, I'm fascinated because you almost did like a one-woman show. So unlike when we read, when we read, we have our book and we have our work. Very impressed by the fact that I just watched a one woman show. So, oh. my question is how long in preparation does it take you to learn what you learn to be able to do this hour ish like as a one as a, as a show? I mean, it's, 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 I'm very impressed. Oh, thank you. Uh, that's a good question. I'm often asked that. <laughs> I think like uh, Marianne Harris Gay, who said she had that gift for pluck and energy and, uh, and her. Uh, divine devotion, that uh, that seems to be my gift to make stories come to life. It took me a while to discover it. And then because I write my stories and I research and adapt the material, I have the benefit of already learning it. Yes, I internalize. Because I often tell people I am the world's worst memorizer. I, uh, when I was doing this, I knew that you would want to hear the Mary Ann Harris Gay story, which I've never done before. And there's some quotes of hers that I wanted to make sure I got it right. Well, they weren't exactly right. Because that's what I have the hardest time learning, the exact quote. But I can tell a story. And it has to do with sequencing, character. And then you know the essence. And you know what it is you want to say. What is it that makes the story so special? If you did it three times, you wouldn't have the exact same Probably not exact, but I do script. A lot of storytellers don't script, but I'm one of those who scripts. You're welcome. What piqued your interest in this area of our country, in this time slot? Is your family in the South? I grew up in North Carolina, but I'm not a true Southern belle because my mother is descended from German immigrants and grew up in Delaware. And my father is a Yankee, or was a Yankee, grew up in New York, in Plains, New York. But they um, moved. Uh, I was born in Texas. So they lived most of their married life in the South, and I grew up in the South. Uh, my brother, um, I think because I've been in theater, I, I can turn an 
on and off the southern accent. But my brother, who lives in Gaffney, South Carolina, he talks like that, and he is a real southern, what you call redneck. And he does uh, reenactments of the Civil War. He is a doctor, and he does um, surgeries. <laughs> and he loves to make the blood spill and do the fake amputation. So, uh, but he and I have very different views of, of the war. He's still fighting it, and I'm still trying to figure out why it happened in the first place. <laughs> so, uh, and I've lived in Atlanta for 20 years, and um, my first, I was a, a dancer, a modern dancer, my first career, and did uh, worked as a dancer in the schools. And then when I started having children, I started becoming a storyteller, going back to children's literature because I had an English background and elementary education. So I started working up stories to tell. And then um, I've always been very interested in history, but when I was in school, you know, we sat at the desks in the straight rows and took notes and the teacher lectured and then you spit it all out on the test. I just thought history was memorizing facts and dates and I've already told you I'm not very good at memorizing. You memorize for the test and then it's gone with the wind, right? It took me a while uh, until I was a storyteller to realize that that's what history is. His story, her story. It's people's personal stories. That's what makes up history. People just like us. And once you figure that out, I mean, you are hooked into history. And here, the Civil War, I thought, I've got to get away from the Civil War. But you can't, because then you read another story. Right now, I'm working on a book on um, Oakland Cemetery, um, stories of people buried there. And it's not all about the Civil War, but a big chunk of it is. And I have steered away from the Civil War, but I always keep coming back because it's so fascinating. My very first historical performance that I did, I was commissioned to do a piece at the Teacher Museum, which is part of Fulton County Schools. It's in Roswell. And students are bussed in for performances. Uh, she, the director there asked me to adapt this juvenile historical fiction book called Turn Homeward, Hannah Lee. Patricia Beatty, any of you heard of that? The story of the Roswell Mill Workers. So that was my very first history show. And then you find when you're doing research, it's so hard to focus on just your subject because you see so many other stories, tangents. Oh, I'd love to do that. I'll get to it, but I want to get to it now. And when I was doing the Roswell Mill Workers, and I, I, which is fictitious, we don't know a lot about them because most of them didn't make it back. But I learned about Cynthia Catherine Stewart from the New Manchester Mills. And she was a real person. And when she was in her 90s living in Texas, her great-grandson had her uh, dictate her experiences as a mill worker charged with treason, arrested and taken to as a prisoner of war. And so we have that today, that she has documented that. And so I based my story, New Manchester Girl, on her real real story. So, I mean, from that, then you read about other things, and that leads you to other things, and then you think, when am I going to find the time to do all this, right? <laughs> yes? Do you find these letters at the Georgia Archives, or where? Uh, the Sherman letters? Uh, he, oh, the women's letters. Um, well, a lot of these were documented. Um, I found a lot of them in a, in a collection that an historian, a female historian, had collected in, um, I think it was the 1970s. And earlier, uh, you know, we, we have had the presence of mind to go around and, and actually interview people who've experienced these things. So these ladies were either interviewed or they submitted these stories. So uh, very few of them are in letter form. Most of them are in story form. And so once you start digging, there is a rich, rich supply of, of actual things that happened to these, these women who are long since gone now. But yesterday, um, I was doing research at Oakland about there's, do any of you know the story of the dye baby? If you've ever had the tour there, it's one of the things they tell. Well, they got a tape in 2002 from the 
her grandmother was the daughter of Sarah Morgan, whose baby was... Well, the story goes, he died uh, in 1864 when, in the summer when we were being shelled. Atlanta was being shelled. And she was no husband there. He was off. House full of kids. What do you do with this child who was two years old when he died? She put him in a box, took him to Oakland Cemetery. She had help from a black gentleman who offered to help her, said it wasn't safe. He helped her dig the coffin at Oakland. And uh, then he said he couldn't take her home. She was exhausted. She fell asleep on the grave for a couple of hours and then worked her way back home, dodging the shells. Well, this, uh, she would be a great granddaughter of Sarah, Die uh, had taped the story. And I heard it yesterday. I was so excited to get it because, I mean, when you find things like that, little jewels, it just makes it worthwhile. You can't always find jewels like that, but that's my jewel for this book. <laughs> to go for research. For, for this book, oh, that is a good question. Uh, you can go to the Atlanta History Center. You can go to the Georgia Archives, and I went to both places. But I think the best source is the Daughters of Confederacy have volumes at the Georgia Archives of women. These weren't the big women, like the women I used to do, were the big stories. But they had a lot of little anecdotal stories that were just priceless. Like this one, uh, you hear a lot. You don't know if it's one of those old wives' tales or if, or if it's true. The story of the three George women are sitting on their front porch and they're watching the Yankees come by. And they're looking at something suspiciously in the front yard. And the Yankees keep digging it up. And it's a, their dog. And they say, that's the third time that old Rufus has been dug up today. So, I mean, stuff like that, that it's too good to, to be true, but you put it in anyway. <laughs> uh, and then other stories like that. One more, one more. I got the message, and it's time. To... <laughs> but we don't have the one more. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you. I have, uh, when I was writing this book, I think I was thinking, um, what would I have done in this situation? You know, we, we say we've got the strength and the fortitude to stand up for this and that, but you never know until you're in a crisis situation. And what, uh, what happened at the campus of Virginia Tech this week that was so horrifying, on my way over here, I heard this young boy tell the story of he was in that French classroom. He's the only one who was not shot out of the 14 in that classroom. And imagine what that child is. And then another boy was saying, he did some heroic things. You never know when you're under a stress crisis situation what you're going to do. So I think when we read stories about people who are in these situations and hear the stories, then I think that just helps us to think that we would be noble or do the noble thing. I think that's true because if you look at the women from the American Revolution up around the Boston area, for instance, you get not these exact stories, but how strong they were. I think that when women are put in tough situations, there's something inside us that really comes to the top. I think especially... You're right. And I think that's especially true when it's your home that's threatened. And I know I've experienced this when my children are threatened. I surprise myself sometimes. <laughs> calm down, calm down. You know, what you do. And thank you for sharing that. Uh, I have, uh, in addition to the, the book that's for sale tonight, I have brochures out there which has... Uh, 
my website on it, if any of you are interested in looking at that and see the various programs I do and getting more information. And then it also has my calendar on it. If you ever want to come see a school show, um, you're more than welcome to come. I but uh, you're making me panic because that's what I should be doing right now. Uh, it's it's supposed to come out at the end of September for some, um, the publisher wants it for some independent book, something or other, uh, that's here in Atlanta. And then I wanted it to come out by the first Sunday of October when Oakland has their Sunday in the park. So that will be the grand, if all goes well according to plan, that's when the, the book will formally be out to the public. And it's fascinating material. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs>